Greetings gamers, welcome to part number 69 of my Let's Play Fire Emblem 10 Radiant Dawn. And in today's episode, it is time to move on to Rebirth Part 3. And hopefully this story will be short and sweet, because it's not been all that sweet so far. <laughs> it makes me wonder what else in my country has been warped beyond recognition. It's possible that the truth was simply mis misunderstood, like the way everyone calls me a dark god. But let me continue. The Zunanma worshipped the girl as their own goddess. They said her hair was as striking a color as Dawn's first light, so they gave her a name, the Goddess of Dawn. She was a much-loved goddess. The Goddess of Dawn. The Zunanma continued to evolve and change, giving rise to a variety of races and tribes across the land. Naturally, each of the races thought their own was superior to the others, and conflict arose between them. The goddess tried to make peace among her people, but nothing could stop the warring Zunanma. Trying to separate the factions, the goddess gave them different names, Legus and Bjork. But this only intensified their conflict. And then the Great Flood occurred. The goddess was only trying to bring an end to the fighting, but her power was so great that all the continents were drowned in the, in the flood, all except Tellius. Are you sure about this story? It's very different from the histories that we've been taught. That's why we have always been so adamant that the Dark God must not be released from the medallion. Legu's rulers have been taught this for generations, though it was particularly stressed in times of war. Hmm. Among Bjork nations, we only know a vague fairy tale about the Dark God stirring up a great disaster. Neither the Legus nor the Bjork have an accurate depiction by the sound of it. I wonder where the story got twisted. There is another standing in our way. I have a feeling he might be able to tell us. F f father Huh? My father, just beyond these doors, my father is waiting. Degencia, King of Goldoa. He's supposed to be one of the three who defeated the Dark God, Yune. He has been blessed by Ashira. Not only that, but he it's a powerful, resilient blessing from long ago. He may be nearly impossible to defeat. Let's everyone get together. There's no t better time than now. I was hoping to avoid this until we reached Ashira. Actually, I hope not to have to do it at all. But she's left me with no choice. I will give you the blessings of Yune, goddess of chaos and freedom. In their natural state, the attacks of mortal creatures have no effect on divine beings. When Ashira set out to defeat me, she gathered her strongest warriors and bestowed on them some of her power. This is called the goddess's blessing. She empowered the dual swords of the Bjork swordswoman. Oh man, wow, you can say that. <laughs> Altina, the Legu's warrior, Soen and Degencia, the leader of the dragon tribe, were all blessed. I failed them, but this time will be different. I'll use Ashira's own tricks, and I won't be defeated. Everyone, take some time now to ready yourselves. Bjork, be sure to equip your best weapons. I'll begin when everyone's ready. All right, so let's go to info. Are you all right, Micaiah? Yes, I'm fine. How about you, Soth? Are you all right? You're not hurt? I'm not a child, Micaiah. When are you going to start treating me like an adult? Show me your hand. What? Look at your hands. They're so big. They were so small when we met. Micaiah. Uh, sorry. Uh, am I interrupting something? C -c commander It's all right, Ike. How can we help you? I was scrounging around in my stuff and found some extra medicine. I figured I'd ask around and see if anyone needed it. I need to get ready. Hey, there's no rush. We still have... He didn't catch a word of that, did he? I'm sorry about that. How long have you been with him? A long time. I met him when I was hiding out in the back alleys of Navasa over ten years ago. He was so skinny, but his gaze was so piercing. I wondered how a, such a young boy could look like that. One day I noticed he was standing close to me, just watching. He continued like that for a few days. One day I held out my hand. He was suspicious of me, but came over anyway. He looked like a scared animal. Then his little hand slipped into mine. 
I w it was shaking. His fingers were so thin and frail. I couldn't let go after that. After that, we traveled together all over the continent. No matter where we went, we were always together. The first time I met him, he'd hidden on a ship we were taking. He mentioned he was looking for someone who was like family to him. It was he. It was you he was searching for, wasn't it? I, I tried to leave him behind when he went to Crimea. I split off from him and took a Begnion ship. But when I reached Begnion, war had broken out between Crimea and Dayan. I knew I had to return to Dayan to look for him. I couldn't find him, so I went to Crimea, but I still couldn't find him. We found each other again after the war in Dayan, in the back alleys of Navassa, where we first met. You took routes opposite to, to each other. When I told him why I disappeared, he got so angry. I'd never seen him get so emotional before. I can't say that I blame him. It'd be pretty... I'd be pretty furious if I heard that someone I loved was wandering around two countries at war. Besides, I'm sure he'd hidden his feelings about being abandoned until he saw you again. I thought I was reaching the limit of how long I could stay with him. He grew each and every day, but I remained the same. I didn't want him to be harmed by the curse I lived with. Can you imagine how hard that would have been on him? You mean the blood of the Legus? So you knew. Did you find out from the boy who's always beside you? Soren, yeah. I guess you both know how to recognize people with a similar nature. Yes, he and I are both branded. Don't use that word. You and Soren are both people, just like me and everyone else. People. You're just like Yune. You call b both Legus and Bjorks people. Why should I care about the color of your hair, eyes, and skin? Or your ears, wings, or tail? No matter how long you live or what powers you possess, we're the same. At the end of the day, we're all people. Soth talks that way, too. His time with you changed him. Thank you, Ike. I've made up my mind. About what? I didn't realize we were talking about... We were doing anything about ta but talking. I thought I might travel to a far-off place after all this was over, but I won't. I'll go back to Dan. No matter what happens, I'll have Soth by my side. I have nothing to fear as long as he's with me. It seems the feelings between you two run both ways. But that's probably the wisest choice for Dan, and Soth too. Anyway. Oh, um, may I have some medicine? Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Survive, Micaiah. We need you, and the goddess you host, to save the people of Talius. Yes, I know. An elixir. I appreciate it, but it's not all the greatest of things to get. <laughs> it is still appreciated, obviously. Like I said, you can't go to shops at this point. Zalgius is the Black Knight. I don't know what to say. It's unbelievable. What was he like in Begnion? He was the right-hand man of my most trusted aide, Duke Seferan of Perseus. He was a hero, a perfect general, and the best swordsman in all of Tellius. He was never anything but loyal. But he was serving another country? Hmm. It makes me wonder how far how Seferan is doing. I doubt he's been turned to stone. Even though he was captured by Lacane and forcibly removed from his post, he'll have found a way to per persevere. Sigrun always said that there is no other master of the arcane arts who can compare with the Duke of Perseus. Makes you wonder, do doesn't it? Ike, don't tell me you suspect Seferan. Well, look at the facts. Do not trouble your mind with that thought. He would never betray me. It's nice to think so, but if he's not petrified, he'd have received a message from Yune, so where is he? The goddess isn't perfect, she said so herself. Maybe the message didn't reach everyone. You have to admit that's a weak excuse. Let's leave it at that for now. We need to focus on moving forward. Please, let's. Oh, I almost forgot, I have something for you. What is it? Um, uh, well, you're my trusted aide, just like Zephyran. You have to live, so protect yourself with this. A mercenary with a contract to act as... An aide to the Empress of Begnion? Who'd have thought? But thank you, Sanaki. You're welcome, Mike, and thank you. Pavis. Very awesome skill. Very awesome skill. Don't know who I'm going to give that to exactly, but it's very useful. Because it's something that can work even when a unit has Nihil or Mantle, as you'll soon see. Hey, take a look at this. Hey now, where'd you stumble across this? Lying around inside the tower, it seemed like the sort of thing I should bring to your attention. That's very nice of you, but you don't have to. Do whatever you want with it. Really? Do you think I'd be able to use it? Well, don't get hasty. I don't think it's right for you. I know, I'm just kidding, Ike. Thanks. It's a very rare item. I'll cherish it. Please do. 
Guard. So we get Guard and Pavis. And I think the reason why this is is because the boss you are about to fight is absolutely incredibly insane to an extreme degree. Now, I have a lot of managing to do, including making sure that all of my units are properly equipped with each individual weapon of his that will allow him to have his best opportunity at dealing damage with or dealing with and dealing damage to certain of the endgame bosses because all the rest of the bosses from this point forward can only be damaged by blessed weapons. And I'm not talking about blessed by Ashira. We're going to see something very interesting here. I will see you all in a few. All right, gamers. So I have everybody equipped with his best weapon to take into this fight including some interesting in inclusions now you can only bless the first weapon the one that you do have equipped but i do also bring a bunch of worm slayers the reason why i have a lot of sword wielding units and i always bring a lot of sword wielding units to this end game is so that each one of them can use a Worm Slayer. So Worm Slayers have 33 might against dragons and Draco Knights, and we happen to be fighting one of those two classes of units. And that's very important to note. So it is time to save, and it is time to fight. I think we're all ready. I'll need the Legus to transform. Let's begin. Okay, I'm all done now. Whew! Hi. That was really hard. I, I think I... I think I need to rest. Micaiah, are you feeling alright? You don't look so good. I'm fine. Thank you, Soth. What happened to Yune? She's sleeping. She wants us to take it from here. All right. If we're all set, let's move out. Father? Kurthnaga, I wasn't expecting this. It's safe to assume then that you've come prepared to fight. How many times have I said it now? How many times have I warned against starting another war? We have betrayed our vow to the goddess. We should have learned, but the fighting never stopped. Now we must pay for our crimes. We must take responsibility and accept Shira's judgment. No, you don't understand. It wasn't the war that awoke the goddess. It was my song. The Galdur of Release freed the goddess. You can't expect me to believe that. We will wait here, patiently, for the punishment we deserve, if you are unwilling to await judgment. You will stand against the greatest of all dragons. Father, no. Why must we fight? There must be a way to talk this through. It's no use, Kurth. We have no choice but to fight. We must reach the goddess, and not even the king of dragons can stand in our way. He says that so very confidently, but in reality, Ike is a joke to, uh, <laughs> to good old Degincia. Alright, so I do have to make sure that all of my units are very well and fit for this fight it's gonna be a rough one and buddy do i mean rough this is one of the toughest chapters in all of fire emblem and i say that with a smile on my face because i love this chapter particularly because you're doing nothing but fighting red and white dragons i think this positioning is perfect um, the white dragons are magical in this game. Imagine, imagine that being a thing in Path of Radiance. I do believe they have a 50 max magic, which is insanity. They also come with br the 
white breath with it, which is magical it's one to two range 16 might all of them i believe have s ranks so prepare for that 54 attack from everybody um and then the red dragons are physical so uh, you can see why ina is kind of like a split between the two the only problem is that she's got such low strength and she attacks on physical strength i really wish she attacked on magical because then like she would be kind of absurd um actually kind of absurd not really that great against most of the end game bosses because the end game bosses have tons of resistance but that's besides the point you do have two side bosses in this particular chapter nazir the white dragon he's almost capped in every single important stat magic and resistance which is insanity comes with a legu's gem and s rank and strike a lot of magic here he also comes with boon returns all adjacent allies units to normal condition white pool increases the magic power and speed of adjacent allies units by five this i believe is in my humble opinion far and away better than blood tide or night tide of course you want to combo all three if you had them Nihil cancels enemy combat related skills and that's it for him then you have gareth who has blood tide he is the physical counterpart to good old Nazir with a ton of strength, a ton of defense. You'll notice that none of the dragons have a lot of speed except for pretty much Ina, Kurthnaga, and Daginsi when I show him off. Um, the All of the dragons have a decent max defense or resistance. So the white dragons have a max defense of 30 and the the red dragons have a max resistance of 30 but none of them have their maxes not even close um and this is kind of disturbing and unfortunate because what it means is that the dragons have very clear weaknesses so the red dragons are ones you want to absolutely fight with your magical units if you can af afford to whereas the white dragons you do not now the black dragons are a true betterment to both classes Mr. Degencia here, a black dragon with 100 HP, 50 strength, 26 magic, 36 skill, 30 speed, and that's nowhere near his cap. I'm pretty sure his cap reaches 38, which is abysmal. I, w I wish he had his cap. I'm, I'm just going to say that right here. I wish he had his cap because there would be next to no units that could double him. 30 luck, 50 defense, 46 resistance, and 25 might, 115 hit on his weapon you're pretty much not going to avoid him. He has a double S rank and strike, of course, and he comes with some interesting skills. So he obviously comes with ire, can inflict triple the normal amount of damage dealt. It's a critical that does not require him to actually have critical against your units. This can and will proc. This is the reason why I have Nihil on all of the units that will be facing him. He also comes with form shift, of course. Night Tide, increase allies resistance and defense by five. You don't want any of the dragons to come up to and next to Degincia, which they will if you allow him. And then he has Mantle. Nullifies all damage inflicted by weapons not blessed by Yune, restoring HP equal to the unit's luck each turn. This skill has a built-in Fortune, a built-in Nihil, a built-in Miracle, a built-in... Um, I want to say Cancel, but I'm not entirely sure on that one. At the very least, it's Nihil, Fortune, and Miracle. And now, the Miracle itself has a much lower proc than actual luck percentage chance because it's built into Mantle, from what I understand. Fortune means you can't crit him, and Nihil means your combat-related skills don't work against him. Plus, he heals the amount of his luck per turn, which is 30, which is pretty amazing. Now, he's not on a defensive tile, which is... I think a missed opportunity. I think he should have been put on, like, not necessarily defense or resistance tiles, but he should have put on, been put on evasion, if you want my humble opinion. I think that would have been cool. Um, going on with the blessings. So now every main weapon that I have equipped on all of my units have unlimited uses usage, and that includes particularly... Um, even weapons that you wouldn't possibly think were good enough for such a thing, which is awesome. This is fantastic. So even my forge here, I was able to bring a forge to the end game, which is nice. It's nowhere near as powerful as the Irvin, but it is basically the best you could possibly get of a ranged axe for Har. 
Only thing that would have been better is if he got the three might instead of two. But being real, with how much hit this has and how much crit this has, it outclasses Tomahawks by a country mile. I put pure water on everybody because that just makes a lot of sense for especially late game. Rex Flame gives plus three speed, which is pretty fantastic for a unit like him. Uh, especially because he's not weighed down by it at all. And now you can see the reason why I was talking about some end game potential of weapons. As she's keeping the Talion, that's pretty cool, pretty neat. The thing is, is that I thought this, and actually tested this out in previous playthroughs, I thought that you could put a weapon in the inventory of your your beast tribe, your Legus, or any of your Legus, period. And that weapon would also be blessed. That's not true. Um, you cannot bless staves either. So even though it would be very cheeky to bless a fortify, and that's what I would pick, the developers thought of this and decided we're going to balance that out of the game. <laughs> Probably for better for some cases. I mean, you already have a very strong team. And though I'm not keen on the whole balance thing in video games being like the only thing that matters to video games and developers and such, I do s still understand that infinite um, party healing at all times would be kind of a bit busted. <laughs> So with that being said, it is time for me to continue my outfit. I was only able to put on items and stuff like that, but not really give experience points. I will see you in just a few yet again. With all preparations complete, it is time to begin. So as you'll notice, the ward wood and the cover become infinitely more useful against these behemoths of enemies. This is one of my favorite chapters in the game, aesthetically as well as like for for the enemies you're fighting, and it's just it's just such a pleasing time. I, I truly do appreciate it. You do have to be very careful though, because like for instance, Sanaki over here, she dies to one hit. I took Paragon off of her as well as everybody else who had Paragon. Um, I changed up some skills and so on and so forth for specific units. I could have given Kirk Naga a little bit more, but it's okay. I think Wrath Resolve Adept is perfectly fine. Neither of the two dragons nor the, the Huron will be targeted by Degincia, and I don't think either Nazar or Gareth. However, Degincia has a map wide attack that spans the reach of his range if you are within his range he will do this attack and depending on how close you are he will hit you with it it is based on his strength so it does his strength and damage and per tile so if you're right next to him it's 50 strength and then it minuses i think either two or three um per tile away you are so there are some types of units you don't want anywhere near Degincia. Now, with that being said, there's some pretty interesting things about this particular chapter. The the Worm Slayers make the chapter way easier in a, in a sense, because, like, for instance here, Ike isn't KOing this dragon without a crit or a proc. So, you have to be mindful of that. I don't think any of the dragons whatsoever will attack Kurth Naga. It's not just... It's not just a few. So you don't necessarily have to be careful with somebody like Kurth or Ina. Especially because both of them by now, if you are using them, should be more than strong enough. Now, of course, I'm not going to be sending them up to the right or anything like that. They're going to be staying in the middle because I'm going to need them in order to KO Degincia. His mighty power is not something I can immediately overcome without some pretty good planning that is to say unless stuff like the worm slayer and dragon foe work on him because if that is the case if dragon foe works on him and i'm not entirely sure on this i'm pretty sure the worm slayer does but if dragon foe works on him canagus who happens to be my dragon foe unit is going to have triple his 22 might here which is going to mean that he's going to have an incredibly insane, and I do mean incredibly insane, amount of attack and damage against the boss. 
So 80 damage here. He's literally one-shotting a red dragon. Physically defensive, mind you. These dragons quite are. Yeah, he got a whopping five experience points for that. So if you're wanting any of your particular units to gain experience points from these units that they are fighting, you don't necessarily want your units to... Like, for instance, Kanegis to take all the experience. He's not going to get any experience from any of these guys that's worthwhile or viable. Wow. You actually hit. I mean, 55 hit. That's not all that unreasonable. It's okay, though, because I plan on healing up. Depending on the level of damage all of my units take, I might need to heal up quite a bit. Um, you just have to be careful of the range of some of these enemies here. So, Sanaki has all of my long-range tomes, and the reason being is because she is not at all going to be able to defeat any of these units in close quarters. Except for maybe the white dragons, but even then, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. She's just not that strong. Like, taking a look at Alencia here, she's got a whopping 11 damage she's doing to this dragon. Now, of course, she does have things like stun, and she can crit... So, it's not all that unreasonable. And, as you can probably tell, I am no longer training any of my units. That does not mean I won't, you know, attack units to get experience points. But what it does mean is that I'm not purposely doing any of this to train. Perfect. This is why I put critical on that weapon. Because I knew that it wasn't going to be the greatest of things. But having 1-2 range is actually very important in the end game. Because all of the enemies from this point forward have 1-2 range. Every last single one has 1-2 range. And that means you kind of don't want 1 range weapons like the Irvin. The reason why it's acceptable here is because the Irvin is just so strong that, and, and Titania is so magically resistive that she doesn't really care necessarily about whether it is just one range. Now, of course, that doesn't mean I'm going to leave her here. I am going to move her far and away back because otherwise she's just going to have quite a bit of trouble. Ah, 22 resistance. He's going to have 32 resistance. Is that going to be enough to deal with both of these? So, they're going to do 22 apiece. Yes. That should be perfectly fine. And I'll get to show off more of Shinon. I actually really, really love the way that marksmen look in this game. All of the marksmen are cool. Shinon is my favorite, of course, but that's because Shinon is awesome. Um, otherwise, you know... Okay, i got to be careful of you... Uh, it is p possible that they could gang up on a specific unit, so I almost want to... I almost want to, um... Not let that happen, per se. I'm gonna shift and wait right here. I can stay right there. I'm also going to use my Legu's gem. Don't want either of these guys being attacked. And I think... How many people do I have to heal? It's only two, right? Yes. So in that case, I'm not going to use a fortify. I think it is fine to leave you here on a resistant tile. And I also want to physic Micaiah. 
After that, that'll be the end of my turn, and it'll be time for Degincia's group to start his onslaught. Yeah, attacking me at range because I can't attack back. This is very typical. It's why you want 1-2 range weapons, and when you don't have them, it definitely shows. You're going to notice, especially in in this chapter particularly, because the enemies in this chapter are the most impressively difficult out of all of the chapters in this entire game, just because of how much damage they can do. If they gang up on any of your units, you're pretty much a dead duck. Kanegis is not taking all that much damage here, which is fine, but he dodges, so... Of course they're going to attack him, because Provoke is a thing. And it is something I put on Kanegis for this particular reason. He has so much HP and bulk that it's okay for him to get ganged up on, especially by the Red Dragons. The Red Dragons are of no effect to him whatsoever. He just has so much defense that... They're doing pretty much nothing. This chapter, like the previous, and like, well, like the previous, I should say, does not have endless reinforcements, but it does have reinforcements for a pretty darn long time. So you can use this chapter to train if you so wished, and a lot of people do. I am not going to, as I have said, obviously, because it's not of any use to me at this current moment. Um, let's... I am not wanting to stay back here with Mr. Doublebow. Very nice, a crit. I appreciate your enthusiasm to take out that dragon. Um, and then... Ooh. Well, if she proc stunned, that would be good, but... Obviously, she's not going to really do anything here. So when she procs done, I can go ahead and use a magical unit to finish this guy off. And of course, she's going to proc more stuns and waste more time. That is perfectly fine. I'm going to attack you. Would be nice if he got a crit, but, uh, you know, you can't ever expect that. Oh, he got stunned, though. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, so as you can probably tell, because of Har's inability to have a stronger weapon than this, even though he does have a good 54 attack, he is not someone I'm going to be using to defeat Degincia. Four damage... It's pretty negligible in the grand scheme of things. All right, so... Thirty-three. Doesn't matter which one I attack. Definitely need to heal up this after this turn. Probably going to have to use a Fortify because I'm going to have a lot of damaged units. One health left. Isn't that intriguing? And you are gone. So there's some very cheeky things you can do in this particular chapter. You can basically complete this chapter in like a turn or two. Maybe like three turns is more likely. Especially if you're using Raphael. But it's just because of like the greatness that is... Dancing. Dancing is just so powerful in this game. The Gulger is is just impressive. I don't foresee you hitting, but even if you do, six damage is kind of measly. And of course, because I put Racin, um, or I used Racin's good old... Uh, I think I'm going to use you two to go up here. I used Rayson's good old um, Legu's gem last turn. He is transformed and ready to move for four units. 
you can already kind of see what I'm going to do here. And I think it's kind of funny because I might be able to complete this turn, this chapter this turn. Or I should say, yeah, well, this turn, yes. What's cool about the dragons not attacking Ina or Kurthnaga, they never will. It doesn't matter how... It doesn't matter if, like, if I had Ina or Kurthnaga sitting right here. Um, the dragons will just walk away around the other way. Okay. And I'm going to wait right here. Then I am going to Gulger for all four of you, which is perfect. I shall move back. I think what I'd like to do here is finish off this dragon before he becomes a nuisance with a combination of Tormod and Sanaki or, you know, Tormod proccing something. I love how beautiful the Rex tomes look in this game. I think they're awesome. One of the best ways to implement higher level tomes, even if they look in such a way that is kind of ridiculous in some in some fashions, like for instance, Tormod was just standing in that pool of lava. <laughs> but still, it's awesome. And Symboline dropping on you. You are gone. A good old dragon defeated, and this means most likely a... Nah, was, nah, not a level up. Not enough of experience points to grant that level up. But it is time to end off this episode. This means that you're going to have to find out next time if Digincia can be defeated in a single turn, at least by my particular party. I want to thank you for joining me. If you like my content, please upvote and follow or like and subscribe, depending on your platform. And while you're at it, have a great and glorious day gaming.